But uh, I'm going to pick up this, this message that we've been going through on what is church. And uh, next Sunday is going to be the last Sunday that I talk about this particular subject, what is church. And the reason I believe it's important for us to define what is church is because a lot of of, of, of us can come into this place and never be part of a church before. We don't know what it, it's for. Or maybe we've been part of a church for a long time and we're trying to define what does this really look like according to the New Testament? What does it really look like according to what the apostles did in the early church, right? So after the last two weeks of study, we developed this definition of what is church. I'm going to read it. The church is a community of people, a community, so it's a group, who each have a relationship with Jesus. So what does this mean to have a relationship with Jesus? I would encourage a couple of things. Relationship with Jesus means a life led by prayer, where we're talking to him, whether we're driving to work or we're waking up in the morning and we're praying, or in the evening before we go to bed, we're praying and speaking to him. A life led by prayer, communicating with the Father, and a life that is devoted to the study of God's word, right? Because last week, I had made a statement that if we are not actively hearing from God, then it is probably because we are not living in his word. Amen? Because the the majority of the time, the way God speaks to his kids is through his word, through the Bible, right? So these two things make up a relationship with Jesus. And there's more. I could spend a whole Sunday preaching on what relationship with the Lord looks like, but we're not on that path today. So going on in this definition... This group of people has the desire to, one, do good works, and two, live pure lives. And that was the last Sunday that I had the opportunity to teach here. We talked about doing good works, and we talked about living a lifestyle of righteousness, or turning away from sin and turning to righteousness. Correct? A lot of you guys were with us. If this is your first Sunday here, I would encourage you to go back and check the last two uh, sermons that was on what is church. They're on our website. You can go on there and click the Owensville campus. It'll show you all the messages that were preached in Owensville on our website. Um, So that'll kind of catch you up to speed because whenever I do these uh, sermon series, I'm usually trying to build on what was taught previously, right? So this morning, I want to give you a brief outline of what we're going through the rest of the morning. And uh, the uh, the first topic I want to talk about is what is church? And then what is the purpose of the church, right? Because we've clearly defined what it is, but now what are we supposed to be doing? What's the purpose of this whole organization here on earth, you know? And um, I, I've laid out three, three ideas. Number one, the purpose of the church is ministry to God through worship, right? Number two, ministry to believers, that's us, nurturing one another and growing in faith. And number three, the purpose of the church is ministry to the world through evangelism, right? Now, evangelism can be a scary thought for a lot of us because we think that this is like street preaching. We are standing on a corner and we're preaching the gospel, trying to evangelize somebody. Or we're sitting on an airplane, right, and we're trapped in this tube, this aluminum tube, and we have the opportunity to minister to somebody who's sitting next to us, right? We've all heard that story where the pastor is preaching to somebody on an airplane because they're trapped there, and by the end of the flight, the person has come to know the Lord, right? Has anybody heard a story like that before? And evangelism can be intimidating. And today I want to lay out a few points on what this church is going to be doing for evangelism that is not intimidating, and it's something that the majority of us, majority of us in this room can participate in. Okay, so the Bible talks about metaphors for the church, and uh, what a metaphor is, I want to go over some grammar real quick. A metaphor is a form of figurative language. Now, this is like seventh grade English, right? So don't fall asleep on me, but metaphors are a form of figurative language which refers to words that mean something different from their literal definition. In the case of metaphors, a literal interpretation would often be pretty silly. So I'm going to sing Elvis for you guys just to get the point across on what this is. Elvis Presley says this. He goes, You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. And he sings this song, right? 
By the way, Evan, can I be on the worship team now? Come on. I earned a spot. I earned a spot. That's for them to decide. That's an audition right there. So anyways, this idea of Elvis singing this song of calling someone a hound dog doesn't mean they're actually a, a dog, right? It just means that this person is a whiny person because they're crying all the time. So he says something that's kind of silly. He's using figurative language to describe someone, right? So I want to talk to you guys about what the Bible uses as metaphors to describe the church. The Bible says that the church is a family, and it's a metaphor that is used saying, I should call older men fathers in the faith, older women mothers in the faith. I should call people that are younger than me sisters, treating them with all purity and respect. My friends and my younger brothers, I should call brothers, the, the men in the church. And it has this family dynamic of church, and it's a metaphor of what we're supposed to be doing, right? You guys have heard that in the Bible before, right? Yeah. All right. The next one is the church is a bride. This comes from Ephesians 5. It's talked about in Revelation that Jesus is returning for a people that he is going to call his bride. Come on. In Ephesians 5, it says we're supposed to live pure and spotless as a bride who he is returning for. The church is a vine, another metaphor of describing the church. How many of you guys have heard Jesus say this before where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches? Yep, some of us have heard this. Whatever branch in me does not bear fruit, I shall prune off and throw into the fire. Scary metaphor, in my opinion. Because he's literally saying, if we're not bearing fruit, we're a dead part of the plant, and it will be pruned off. Scary metaphor. Then there's another one that's probably my favorite, and it is that the church is an ag field. It talks about the wheat and the tares in the Bible. It talks about planting and sowing and reaping. And the reason this is so hits home to me, I guess, is because I come from a family of farmers. You know, I've got two uncles, Rodney and John. They plant a lot of crops, row crops, corn, and beans. And in order to plant those fields and make them come up, they have to spread fertilizer. They got these giant anhydrous nitrogen tanks that they put nitrogen in the ground with. Um, the lime and fertilizer there is to kind of stabilize the soil and make it nutrient so the plant can grow, right? So that hits home to me, but even more so, it hits home to me in the idea of an ag field being a food plot. How many of you guys are hunters in the room and have planted food plots before? You guys can raise your hand in here. It's okay. Now, if you have someone in your family who plants food plots, raise your hand, or you just know somebody who's planted food plots. There we go. So we've got a few hands up in the room. The idea of a food plot is this, for anybody who doesn't know. We want to kill big bucks, right? That's the purpose of November. So we go out in August when it's hot and dry and the ground is hard, and we get a plow on a tractor and we break this fallow ground, and we turn it upside down. We turn this ground upside down, and we turn the weeds under so that they're no longer able to grow. And we make sure that that old stuff is dead. And now we go out there with our fertilizer, and we're walking on the ground with a seed spreader like this. Or if you've got a tractor or a full wither, you're out there with your cedar doing it like that. But we're literally spreading good things on the soil now. And we're throwing out fertilizer. We're throwing out lime. And finally, we plant the seed. And then, like, it's, it costs like a good $300 or $400 an acre to plant food plots. Come on, does anybody know how, how this works? You go down there and you buy seed and it's $60 bucks an acre. By the time you buy the lime, it's $100 an acre. And the fertilizer is another $100 an acre. And then you're like, Lord, please, would you just bring the rain and make this grow? <laughs> because I've invested all this time and energy and, and the cost of getting this to grow. Because we're in the pursuit of these big antlers in the fall time. And I say all that because this idea of the church being an ag field is so important because it's like that for our daily lives, to where we can live in a season and we can get hard and stagnant and weeds can begin to grow up in our life. And it's time that we turn over the fallow ground and do the hard work of plowing, even in August when it's hot and nobody wants to be out there working when it's 95 degrees. But we do that to reap a reward in the future. Amen. I'm going to talk about a few different um, metaphors as we go through this uh, lesson this morning. The, the, the last one I want to mention here, and we'll catch up on it later at the end of the service, is that the church is a body. The church is a body. 
Okay, so asking this question, what is the purpose of the church? Topic number one that I had outlined for us is ministry to God. Ministry to God through worship. And this is interesting to me. This is in Psalms 22.3. We're going to throw it on the screen here. This is the King James Version, so bear with me. But it says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. And it's saying that God has come to his children and he inhabits their praises in Israel. Because the Israelites were his kids, right? And if you read Romans, then the Gentiles are engrafted in. And that means that God inhabits the praises of his people today. That means that when we are here and we are singing, we have an open door saying, Lord, I praise you, I honor you, I exalt you. And he comes in this building and he inhabits the praises of his people. When you're driving in your car to work and you're singing hallelujah, and maybe you've got Joy FM on or you've got Elevation Worship turned up in the car, he has come to inhabit the praises of his kids. Amen. And then, furthermore, in Revelation 3.20, the Bible says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, here I am. I stand at your door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And this is so important, knowing that Jesus has come to inhabit the praises of his people. And we can say, Lord, I just invite you in. I want you to fill me up, Lord. I need your presence. I want your Holy Spirit to lead my life. I submit to your leadership, Lord. And this is the purpose of the church, that we should magnify God, exalt him, and praise him through worship, through worship. I uh, was able to join the worship team before they started this on Sunday mornings. They had gone through several um, Wednesday night Bible studies on what is worship And they did an awesome uh, breakdown of some Greek words on what is worship. And it was just really neat to see that in in the Greek and the Hebrew, there were seven seven different definitions of praise. Like everywhere that you see praise in the Bible, there were seven different descriptions in the old language that described how it was. Some of them were raising hands and magnifying the Lord. Some of them were like David when he danced and his clothes fell off because he was praising the Lord. Just this extreme unction to praise him. And I want to say that our responsibility as Christians, our responsibility of the church is to praise this creator God who has created the heavens and the earth. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. And we cannot do anything except to say, Lord, I praise you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Amen. This is us, church, one of our purposes to praise and worship him. Paul actually directs the church in Colossians. This is Colossians 3.16. He says, to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And then furthermore, in Ephesians 1, he says that we are to live For the praise of his glory. We are, as people of God, to live to praise his name. Amen. Some of us, so much so, that this is our calling. Like Our calling is to be a worship leader. Our calling is to be a singer. A musician up here on the stage like Sandy playing the drums. Or Evan, or Sandy playing the drums. Sandy playing the piano. Evan playing the drums, right? I would like to see Sandy playing the drums. That would be good. But um, to actually be called to this ministry. And um, I want to make this statement. We're going to go through a few different things here this morning. Worship, nurturing, and evangelism. And you, personally, may be called to one area, but not the other. Like me, I know that I'm called to be a mouthpiece and speak for God. Like my body part in the body of Christ is to speak. My body part is to nurture. I am to evangelize as a pastor and, 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 and talk to people, right? That's my strong suit, I guess you'd say. Evan's strong suit, Corey Rutledge's strong suit, these guys can sing well. I don't know if I can sing well. I mean, I did Elvis. That's a pretty good impersonation. But we need to recognize our calling in the body of Christ and begin to step into it and say, hey, I want to do worship in the church, or I want to help teach in the church. I want to help evangelize in the church. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out some practical ways here in a minute on how this is going to look in Gray City Church, Owensville. I know we've got 15 minutes left. I might be a little bit long this morning. Ministry 
to believers is point number two. This is the idea of nurturing the church, okay? So this idea of nurturing comes from the metaphor, the food plot analogy. Because when we turn over that ground and we're bringing new people in here, we are called as a church to nurture other believers and help them grow up in the faith. I am called to be spreading lime on you guys. I'm called to be spreading fertilizer on you guys, sharing the word of God with you guys so that we can grow into be healthy plants and bear fruit like the vine that Jesus talks about. Amen? Who all wants to bear fruit in this place? A lot of us. That's good. So, I want to read this scripture out of 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. And um, this is Paul. And he's talking to the church of Corinth. And he says, I planted the seed. And what he's talking about in this church of Corinth, he's saying, I planted this church. When he came to Corinth, he rallied a group of believers together, preached them, taught them the word of God. Now they've established a church in Corinth. He hands the torch to Apollos. Watch what's, what happens. Apollos watered the seed. So Paul planted the seed. Apollos watered the seed. But God has been making it grow. You remember when I got on my hands and knees a minute ago, I said, God, would you bring the rain on our food plot and make it grow? My prayer for this body of people is that, God, I ask that you would bring the rain and make it grow in this place. I ask, Lord, for spiritual depth over this body. I ask for an outreach, Father God, that we would be able to evangelize our community and be able to help the people who are in need. I ask, Lord, that you would give us an open door into the schools, that we're able to reach into the schools and affect teenagers and youth and help them raise up a new generation of believers who are pursuing you in a life of faith like they are in Kentucky. Have you guys seen that outpouring in Kentucky? It's been awesome. Um, so anyways, he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. Church, you are God's field. You are God's building. Now I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how we are practically going to apply this nurturing in our community. At Gray City Church Bourbon, they've done a good job of developing life groups. This is small groups, basically. And I want to tell you guys what life groups is. I want to lay a pretty simple definition of it. We are going to launch life groups at this church this fall. Um, they typically run a spring semester of life groups and a fall semester of life groups. And what life groups is, I've led them before. We usually just have a group of people over to the house, um, say at 6 o'clock on a Friday night, and we'll have dinner together. Everybody brings finger foods or something simple, or we'll make spaghetti and pasta with uh, salad and breadsticks, and somebody else brings drinks. We all just get together and hang out, and we just eat together. The kids are running around wild in the basement, or they're outside because the weather is nice. And then, after we have a time of fellowship together and dinner, just hanging out, then we'll usually study the Word for a little while. And we can go through, right now, media, that subscription that our church has. We've led one through the book of James, I think, and Ephesians. And what that looks like is, right now, media gives us awesome tools. So for me, as a life group leader, I was able to go on there, download the leadership packet, and then just teach off that leadership packet our group. And it was awesome development for me as a leader to be able to take up a mantle of teaching and say, hey, I just want to have 15 people over to the house, and we're just going to study the Word of God together. And it builds relationships so that you are actually doing life together so that whenever you have a, str uh, a struggle in your life, I've now built a relationship with Kurt, or I've built a relationship with Chris, or I've built a relationship with John, and I'm calling these guys saying, hey, I'm struggling with this right now. Can you pray with me? Or can we get together and talk? And I've got this hardship in my life, and I need my brothers and sisters, right? Because we are doing life together, amen, at Grace City Church. This is what we are called to do as a community of believers, a group. So life groups is simply eat, have fun, and do Bible study. And I'll tell you this. Sometimes at life groups, you don't get to the Bible study. Because by the time you've had dinner, 
had laughs and you're just hanging out around a campfire outside, it's 9 o'clock and it's time to get the kids in bed and we didn't get to Bible study that night. And that's okay. Like we want to be a church that hangs out and fellowships with one another. So this fall, as I begin here, we're going to launch life groups. I wanted to begin to have folks say, hey, I want to host a life group at my house or I want to lead a life group at my house. And what Kenny has done a great job of structuring life groups is this. You might have someone who hosts a life group. Let's say we go to Kurt's house, and we're hosting at his place. And then Corey comes into Kurt's and leads the Bible study. And that works great because then they have to clean up their house, and I don't have to <laughs> after life group's over with. But there's such a thing that Kenny did a good job structuring it this way, is you have people who host, and you have people who teach. So I just want you guys to be thinking about your place in the body. Maybe you want to host a life group. Maybe you want to lead a life group. But I want everybody attending life groups. Because when we attend a life group, that's where we really begin to build relationships with one another. And we get to know each other. And I, I learn what everybody's kids' names are. And it's great. It's, it's awesome to be that family. So life groups. This is the nurturing aspect of Grace City Church, how we grow and develop. Sunday mornings can also be considered nurturing, but I think it's great whenever we, as a family, get together and have a group of 10 or 15 or 20 people doing church together. Because in all seriousness, guys, the early church met in homes. They met in people's homes, and they just get together and hang out and have food. That's what it was. In America, we have made church all about this Sunday morning experience instead of actually understanding that it's more about a relationship level of knowing your brothers and sisters, going through life together, and studying the Bible together. Amen? So that's life groups, nurturing. Now, I want to talk to, about you guys, to you guys about the next subject. This is ministry to the world, and it's evangelism. I've got eight minutes to do this and then close. And I want to talk to you guys about evangelism for a minute. Because like I said earlier, evangelism can seem daunting and overwhelming. But what Jesus tells us that we should do is to make disciples of all nations. That means Owensville, Missouri. Amen? It means that we should make disciples of all nations. This work of declaring the gospel is the primary ministry that the church has towards the world. Yet, accompanying the work of evangelism is also a ministry of mercy, a ministry that includes caring for the poor and the needy. Although the emphasis of the New Testament is on giving help to those who are part of the church, there is still affirmation that it is right to help unbelievers even if they do not respond with gratitude or acceptance to the gospel message. Now this is a cool thought, because we have the hand-in-hand -hand box to help those who are within the church. Jesus also teaches us to help those who are outside of our local body. Watch this. This is uh, Luke 6, 35 through 36. And he says, love your enemies, and do good, and lend. Expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. So be merciful even as your father is merciful. And that's the words of Jesus. So in its simplest form, our job to represent to the world is to love them. It's to love the world. It's to produce a ministry of mercy and to help those who are in need. And maybe to help those who don't know him to come in to know him, right? To be a body of people that invite, amen? Invite people to church. Invite people to your life group. Invite people to whatever Bible study you're attending. And I want to do evangelism here in two ways. Now, these are two ideas that we've come up with so far. And as we begin to launch these and get them established effectively, we will begin to do more. But the first thing is we'd like to do is this free student breakfast that's going to be maybe Wednesday mornings, maybe Friday mornings. Haven't quite nailed that down yet. But a free student breakfast means that I would love to target a goal to have 100 students in here from the high school or the middle school and feed them early morning on a Wednesday and just say, hey, we're going to start this breakfast where uh, we're going to have breakfast sausage, eggs on one Wednesday. The next one we're going to do pancakes. The next one we'll do bacon, biscuits, and gravy. 
have a little variety for them. But from six or excuse me, from 7 to 7.30, we just have breakfast and get to know these students and say, hey, we love you guys. We love that you're here. Um, come in. Enjoy a free meal, a hot meal. Um, the more I got involved at, at Life House in, in Sullivan, just a, a little bit, when they first established that uh, ministry over there, Life House, if you don't know what that is, is basically a free open house for kids to come after school. They can get tutoring. They can play games. They've got video games. They've got foosball. They've got pool. And I will say that there are a lot of kids that are teens and middle schoolers that live in very unfortunate circumstances. There are a lot of students that have a way harder life than you and I ever had. And that they are in a pivotal point in their life to either say, I'm going to choose this road or I'm going to choose this road. And I want to be the body of people that introduces them to the right road. Amen. And here at this place, what we're going to do is start the student breakfast and in all seriousness, I just need some people who want to cook food for these kids and, and say, hey, I want to come be a part of this ministry. And at 6 a.m., I'll be here, and I'll get the, the what do we have? Uh, my buddy donated a Blackstone Grill. So this Blackstone Grill we've got back here in a box, we'll roll it outside. We'll throw eggs on it and cook it. Another buddy of mine just donated a, a hog, and we've got a freezer and a half full of breakfast sausage. Praise God. that so We've got a freezer and a half full of breakfast sausage already. Um, eggs and bacon, all that stuff. We'll, we'll need to start collecting that. And guys, this is the part of the church that we all have the ability to say, hey, I, I'd like to be a part of that. Or maybe you don't and you want to be a part of life groups. But this is the part where in a few minutes I'm going to make this declaration out of, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, about being a part. And we get to pick which part of the body God has laid on our heart, right? But... Um, Basically, I just want to make this pitch. For the student breakfast, we will need folks here from 6 to 7 just to do food prep and begin to cook and to throw a bunch of biscuits in the oven and cook them. Um, from 7 to 7.30, I'm going to do breakfast with the kids. We're going to have that in the back, back there in the uh, kids' church because we're not going to dirty up the carpet. Um, and then from 7.30 to 8, we're going to do a Bible study, and I'd like to do Q&A for the students because I think it's important for kids to come with questions and say, I don't understand this about the Bible. This is way over my head. What does this mean? And if I don't have an answer for them, I'll study it, bring it back next week and say, here's the answer for that. But I think it's important to establish kids in their faith so that when we turn them out of Owensville and we send them into the world, they have a foundation of why they believe what they believe. Because it's easy for me to be raised in the Bible Belt of America and just be like, well, I believe the Bible because mom and dad taught me that way. But with that logic, if I was raised overseas in China, I'd likely be Buddhist. If I was in Iran, I would likely be Islam. That logic doesn't cut it. The logic of understanding the Bible, why I believe what I believe, is considered apologetics. And our youth desperately need apologetics in this day and time. So anyways... Going through Bible study and Q&A from 7.30 to 8 and cut the kids loose at 8 and say, hey, school is 60 seconds down the road. It starts at 8.20. Now get to class, right? And we've got somebody in the church who's looking into getting a bus that a, a bus will just come by here and stop outside. And we can say, hey, kids, just go jump on that bus. They're going to take you right to school, and you're going to get there on time. So praise God. I think that's going to be an awesome ministry, don't you guys? The second way that we want to evangelize to the world through Grace City Church is this. There's a program called Love Thy Neighbor. There's a guy I know in Viburnum who's doing this with their church. I think it's First Baptist in Viburnum. Love Thy Neighbor is a program like this, where you identify someone in your community that has a need, like a new roof or a wheelchair ramp, or they have windows in their house that are broken and they need to be replaced. They don't have the funds to fix it, but I would love for us to be a generous group of people who are able to fund ministries such as this and say, no, we'll give to that need. And then we're able to go out as a group of guys and say, let's throw shingles on this roof and shingle this house for people. Love Thy Neighbor was started down there, and it has exploded to where now it's a week-long event in the fall where they knock out multiple things. They'll do wheelchair ramps. They'll do roofs. They do all kinds of activities. Last week, Shay emailed me and said, hey, there's a lady in Bourbon who emailed our church and said that she went and had a surgery done, and um, long story short, she's now paralyzed because the surgery didn't go well. And she needs a wheelchair ramp at her house, but she's so covered up in medical bills that now she can't even afford to build a wheelchair ramp, 
nor can she build one because she is immobile from the waist down, right? So this lady is reaching out to multiple churches to say, hey, could you guys help me? And literally, this is a person who's stuck in a rock in a hard place. You can't do anything for themselves because they're now paralyzed. And when I hear needs of this, my heart goes out. And I want to be a, a group of people that has a group of men around me to say, hey, I know you guys know how to swing a hammer. I know you guys have tools in your truck. We could just take a Saturday out there and go build a wheelchair ramp and buy $400 worth of lumber. Amen. I think that these kind of ministries is what it takes to show the world that the church actually cares about the world. Come on. So we're going to be starting that up this fall. Love thy neighbor um, to where we are actually going to take up like a special offering at some point and say, hey, we've identified this need in our community and we are going to go do this as a group of dudes. I mean, hey, girls, if you want to swing a hammer on a roof, by all means, come join Love Thy Neighbor. But it's probably going to be dirty jobs. So it's going to be fun, too. Like, I mean, we'll grill pork steaks and stuff while we're there and have a blast with it. So, and usually these types of things, so I've been on mission trips before, right, where we've gone a long ways away from home, worked hard, fixed people's houses, done all this stuff with hurricanes and whatnot where people are deeply impacted by the weather. And when you get done with a mission trip like that, you feel so, like, fulfilled. Like, man, this is what we're supposed to be doing with our life. And I want to bring that to our community, not just where we're doing evangelism overseas. And it's important, right? It is important. We fund four different missionaries through Gray City Church. But I want to do that stuff here. So, um, Corey Rutledge, if you're here, I want you to come up here for a minute. Um, I want to talk to you. Oh, he's here already. Okay. I didn't know you'd be that fast, so bear with me. I was expecting him to have a 30-second walk from the back. <laughs> I want to talk to you guys about this and raise a question. So who's going to do all the work that the church wants to do? Like, the church wants to start life groups, like five or six life groups, and have 10 or 15 people in each life group. We want to put roofs on people's houses when they're desperately in need. We want to do a student breakfast and get these kids plugged into their Bible. But can the pastor do it all? Like, can me as one man take this mantle and do everything myself? It would be impossible for me to do church on Sunday, lead every event, and then go home and expect to be a husband and a father and completely have balance in my life. So as a church, I'm just going to ask, what do we want to do as participants in this? Because I looked up some facts this week, and the average tenure of a pastor, which means his average length in ministry, is three to five years. Because pastors' jobs are usually high demand, with tons of responsibility and a lot of pressure. They can be very underpaid for their work, which can lead to burnout and stress. And I'll be honest, I make $250 a week doing this, you know, here at Grace City Church. Um, and anyways, that's on a different schedule. But uh, just to talk about, like, can one man do everything here? It's not a possibility. And as the body of Christ, we are called to be the body. You can come over here, brother. And I want to take a look at Corey's body here because um, he is the perfect embodiment of a man, right? Uh, no. So me and Corey, we're both, we're, this is two Corys up here, so this is cool. Two Corys. We both have receding hairlines. Like, we kind of have the dad bod going on. Even though I'd say it's a dad bod, it's more like a father figure, right? Come on. <laughs> we're, it's, it's a father figure, not a dad bod. But I want to read this message to you guys up here out of 1 Corinthians. It says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. Okay, so Jesus is teaching us about anatomy. The church tells us that Jesus is the head, and he instructs the church accordingly. And Corey has an arm here. He's got a hand, fist, finger, a foot, a mouthpiece. And on this body, we're called to identify which part we're supposed to be, right? This is the call of 1 Corinthians 12. And I've been talking about it for three weeks, but today we're illustrating it and we're actually reading the passage. It says, this is how it is with Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. This is the church. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. That means everybody's included. And we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. So now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, if I do not, be I do not belong to the body, it would not be, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? 
If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just how he wanted them to be. So God's placed assignments on each and every one of us. And I will say it does take boldness. It does take courage. It does take faith to be like, God, I see what you're wanting me to do in my life. And now I'm going to step into that responsibility. I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be a part of your church. And he says, if they were all one part, where would the whole body be? As it is, there are many parts, but just one body. And now you, church, are the body of Christ. And each and every one of you is a part of it. Thanks, man. So Christ, being the head of the church, we are his body, of which he is the Savior. So I'll make this pitch to us as a group of people, of believers. In the fall, we need to raise up life group leaders, folks who want to teach the Bible. And it's not complicated. The, the, uh, the software that we have at church, the uh, Right Now Media, makes it super easy to lead those groups. We're going to need help thy neighbor leaders, guys who know how to swing a hammer and guys who know how to put together lumber. Youth breakfast cooks and cleanups. Like we'll have that going on for a while. And maybe you can't meet the whole time, but you could just come in and cook for 30 minutes. Or you'd come in at the end and just clean up the church afterwards. Whatever that looks like for you, I want you guys to come see me at some point over the next couple of weeks and say, hey, you talked about that certain ministry and I want to do that, so just plug me in there. And I'm going to start making lists of people who want to serve in different areas of the church. Kids church leaders. What we've got going on in the back is awesome. I don't know if you guys have, have seen that, but raising up our kids, including my own, to understand the Bible is so important for the next generation. Um, nursery leaders, to be able to have a place where, and I'll, I'll give you a small background because we've already over six minutes, but it, I know some friends of mine who would love to come to church, but they don't like to go because their kids won't sit through a church setting. They get kind of um, rambunctious. And the ability to provide child care back here is so important because families who are in that setting can now come in and say, hey, if you could watch my rambunctious kids for an hour or whatever, then I can attend church, right? And this is actually providing growth in the church. So I would encourage you, if you want to hold babies or if you want to lead kids' church and teach the kids, I would encourage you to sign up for that. You can see myself, you can see Ashley, and we'll get you plugged in. I had a testimony to put in here. Um, but it's probably a 20-minute testimony, so we're not doing that. And um, I want to close. Um, so at the end here, I'm going to pray. But this is a time of communion. So whenever the worship team begin to, begins to, to lead us, this is a time just to get before the Lord. You partake of his blood, partake of his body, and remember him. And this is a moment for us to reconcile our hearts and reconcile our minds and say, God, I know I messed up this week. And here I am once again before you, just saying I'm going to set things straight. And I repent, and I'm going to turn to you once again. And after a message like this, I would even encourage you to begin speaking to him and just talking to him like a dad and a son. And say, Dad, where would you want me to lead in your body? What part would you have me to do in this place? Maybe it's the parking team. Maybe you just want to pass the buckets, you know, take up offering. Whatever that looks like, I want us as a body to get plugged in here. So you guys can take up communion. I'm going to invite you up here for prayer. If you're going through any stronghold or struggle in your life, maybe it's divorce, maybe you've got kids who need prayer, maybe it's a health issue, I'm going to stand up here, and you're welcome to come up, and I will pray with you at the end of this service. Um, so let's just pray right now. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for being here, God. I thank you for people who um, want to be here and just want to do your work, Father God, in this community, in this place. God, you are holy. And we just invite you to inhabit the praises of your people this morning. Because you stand at the door and knock, Lord. And I open the door to you this morning and just say, come into my heart. Come into this place. Instruct us, God. Open our ears. Open our eyes, Lord, to the things of you. Help us to grow in depth, in maturity, in knowing your word. Help us to develop lives of prayer, lives of praise, lives with fasting and spiritual maturity. God, we honor you in this place. We give you all the glory and all the honor, and we magnify your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.